Um, welcome to um, uh, this week's uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, seminar. I'm really delighted today to, um, to welcome Professor uh, Li Weiqin from Wake Forest uh, University. Um, uh, Li Weiqin's a uh, familiar figure to those of us, us that study uh, Taiwanese uh, politics. Um, in the um, recommended reading for our Taiwan politics class in week one, he's on our reading list yes. for his article on, his state of the field article on uh, Taiwan's international states. That article, the, uh, that issue of the studies piece from about 2003 or so. Um, uh, we also know him through his um, e uh, edited volumes on, on Taiwan. Uh, Sayonara Li Donghui, for example, uh, or um, the um, uh, Taiwan politics in the 21st century, yes. uh, another really important uh, edited volume looking at Taiwan in the, um, uh, the post-2000 uh, era. Um, and, I mean, we're really fortunate to be able to invite him uh, here today. Um, he's, uh, he's in London for one term. When I heard he was in London for one term, then the immediate reaction I had was, OK, well, I'm going to force you to come and uh, give a talk. Um, um, and um, Professor Lee's speciality is really Taiwan's international uh, relations. So that was one of the reasons why um, I opted for this for him to speak about this topic, Taiwan's international space, uh, opportunities and challenges. Although I should say, though, if you look through his CV, you can see this. It's extremely diverse. Uh, there's even st there's, uh, there's international relations, there's cultural policy, um, civil military relations. Um, you, see, you see the study everything. Um, OK, uh, the way we're going to structure this is the presentation will be maybe something like 40, 45 minutes. Or maybe shorter than that. It, it depends. Uh, uh, so that, uh, hopefully we should have a fair amount of, um, of time for, uh, for Q&A. Okay, without further ado then, over to you, Professor. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here to, to meet uh, new faces. At, at the same time, I already heard the discourse so many years, and finally I've set my foot here, so I should take a picture of myself. <laughs> All the concept. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, today, what I, I plan to talk about will be the, if you can see here somewhere, so Taiwan's expansion uh, of international space and opportunities and, and the challenges. The, since Taiwan has had a regime change in 2008, and then certainly there are all kinds of uh, uh, situational phenomenal change, particularly cross-strait relations. So for Ma Injo, the present Ma, uh, one of his arguments is, well, we're going to move into a new era in terms of cross-strait relations and the de creation of uh, no independence, uh, no unification, and no use of military forces, and all this kind of thing under the constitutional framework. So in terms of a dipl a diplomatic ties, what he proposes, let's have a diplomatic ceasefire. Okay? So we don't try to use the monetary uh, diplomacy, try to get someone, some country to convert their diplomatic re uh, recognition from China to Taiwan. At the same time, you do the same thing, even though that's pretty much a consensual understanding without any kind of official recognition by the other side. But at least so far, so good, except one country was try to get advantage from both sides, Gambia, so sort of last year they decided, to, well, we are going to try it. And so, but from all the media sources, it seems that it's, it's working on that, on that front. The difficult part actually is on the international organization, this part. And then this part, uh, they, they try all kinds of ways, but then still the, the process is not very uh, smooth. Uh, so if you look at all this kind of situation, my, my topic actually is trying to make arguments that if coming from China's point of view, because a lot of people already talk about Taiwan's perspective, they say, well, definitely I want to be represented, definitely I want to be a member of the, uh, any kind of international organization I want to do. And I can give you tons of opinions from Taiwan's uh, perspective. Okay? But today I, I'm going to remove uh, that kind of a position, location, a little perspective, a little bit, coming from China's side. I, I'm trying to make an argument that if, if China decides to 
encourage or promote Taiwan's international space. Actually, it's a, not only an advantage to Taiwan, but also an advantage from, on, on China side. So that's a sort of reverse thinking a little bit uh, from that perspective. So I'm going to concentrate more on the China's interest in terms of expansion of uh, Taiwan's international space. And then if you, if you're in the IR field, there's something we got, uh, sorry, and, you know, professor cannot avoid any kind of uh, theoretical discussion, even though I, I'll simply just run through it very quickly. You've got the realism, liberalism, or, and the constructivism, and it's something that every RSM, they have a different view, and even the English school of international politics or international relations, you got, still got the realist over there, you also got internationalists, and Hadley Booth, the an analytical society, that's a famous one, and then they know you have a whole group of English uh, scholars in international politics, they're also pushing similar kind of direction. Whatever I say, you try to talk about it. My point, actually, is trying to say that it doesn't matter if you're realist, there's still an advantage that you try to look into the other side, and sometimes, if necessary, for even for your own power consideration, you can still reach some kind of mutual understanding. And liberalism certainly is a very convenient one. You talk about democratic peace theory, you talk about the in, in a complex interdependence, and you talk about all, all these kind of argument coming down international organization actually quite helpful for the cross-trade relations. All the constructive approach, you can even make the argument is, well, maybe we need to change our mindset, change the discourse. Okay? Because a lot of speech act or the communicative action, uh, through that kind of action, if, if you've got to reiterate the actions and sometimes repeat it, and they build up that kind of behavior patterns and change or mold the thinking logic of both sides. And then maybe through all these years, you create some kind of norms, some kind of patterns of exchange. And maybe that pave the way for future whatever you decide to do. At least you maintain the status quo. So that's the, all those eyes and they try to argue. But another, another one I, I try to do it very quickly is even for the realists, yes, we understand cross-trade relation. China is the big guy. Taiwan is right now, relatively speaking, it's just a little guy. A little guy sometimes, well, the weak, if you want to uh, really get some kind of advantage, sometimes the weak can, can, can get some kind of advantage by trying to negotiate with the other side. It's not necessarily uh, completely for the strong advantage of it. So, but on the other hand, if you're coming from the strong point of view, how are you going to get the weak to sign in to compromise? Sometimes strong need to undercut its own privilege a little bit. Because the purpose you want to do is you restrain yourself, and the purpose is you want to lock in, or the rope in, or like, like put the rope or that kind of rope, rope in the weak side to get into the deal, which can be sort of mutually beneficial, but at the same time, in the long run, to the advantage of the strong one. So that's a strong and weak, that kind of argument of it. And then all this kind of argument, certainly you can also argue that, well, if you've got a smooth uh, uh, cross-trade relation, certainly you, you minimize this security dilemma, which is a familiar term for international politics. So if you look at all this, the benefits for Taiwan's join the in, in global community, you can see, it, uh, I, I can read it for you uh, quickly. It's a process legitimacy. In, in other words, you, you allow Taiwan to have some, some voice, some representation, and then you, you try to dem democratize the, the international institution or international organization. The process legitimacy is basically for the output legitimacy. So whatever policy decision you decide to do, uh, you, you have Taiwan in, and then later on you can ask Taiwan and say, well, you, you, you promise or you agree to certain, certain kind of standards, and certainly your compliance is supposed to be there. So that's one. Or you also are trying to avoid any kind of jurisdictional gap or operational gap or incentive gap uh, in terms of uh, creating all kinds of uh, transnational or transboundary government, uh, intergovernmental issue of it. You can also make an argument that, well, if I'm coming from English school, there is a uh, universalism, that kind of argument, the society of the people instead of the society of, of the state. Uh, and so if that's the case, and then certainly from that point of view, you would say, well, let the people have some kind of voice, even though that's only 23 million people. But it's still, there are a lot of voices. And it's still, that's under, in, in terms of internal sovereignty, Taiwan is really in charge. China, you, you, you really couldn't get into it in terms of internal sovereignty. Okay. So that's the benefits through a global uh, community. For Taiwan, I can run through very quickly. You, you, got the, you can reduce the transactional costs. You can 
have a peace promotion, you can have economic benefits for both sides, you can have a democratic aspiration, because sometimes international society set up certain kind of policy, you internalize. Because just like in, in Taiwan, the typical arguments or the debate all the time is, is death penalty supposed to be carried out or not? Because you do have the uh, international covenant on civil and political rights or whether there's one particular article, if you promise that you're going to obey it or, or comply with it, then no death penalty, even though certain countries make all kinds of reservations of it. But still, in terms of the goal or the vision, the principle is supposed to be there. So you got a democratic aspiration of it. You have better governance in demo, uh, dem domestic democratic uh, consolidation. Uh, typical one is if you're familiar with the Chen Shui Bian uh, scandals, and there's one particular group, Egmont, you know, that's actually trying to find out all kinds of anti laundry money laundries, and scandals, and so you can trace all those money where they go, and all this kind of process. You can prevent the political spoilers uh, from using uh, international frustration and also China's disruption for domestic uh, politics gain. So you have all kinds of reason for it. So uh, not, not to mention that uh, there is some kind of diplomatic link over there. And then in, in case you don't know too much about uh, Taiwan and here, actually you probably won't be able to see it. Uh, there is a website say comparing United Kingdom and the Taiwan. So if, if the United Kingdom were your, your home countries instead of Taiwan, you would, for example, use 43.46% uh, less electricity, you have a 35.59 more chance of uh, being unemployed and blah, 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 all this kind of thing, and you have uh, more, 18.95 more babies. So lucky, living in, in UK is quite productive in, in this sense. <laughs> you can make more, for example, 18.8, you know, 18.8, 18 more money, and then, uh, and you, have, you live one year longer than those people living in Taiwan. So I uh, allow you to give some idea about the Taiwan's economic and social standards uh, in comparison with the UK. Quickly run through the Taiwan's IGO status. Uh, Taiwan, in 1966, before Tao was uh, removed from the UN membership, Taiwan was a member of the 39 IGO. IGO stands for international organization, intergovernmental organizations. Then after 1971, okay, in 1977, the number of Taiwan's membership only 10. Reverse situation for China, if in 1966, one, with China's policy at that time, they decided to do that way. 1977, reverse, expanded to 22. And it, you, you also need to remember that China at that time, they, they do uh, face a, a question, the question is because they just open up and they don't have enough diplomatic and, they, and, and, and most of the diplomat they, they, they train actually is before 1949 and then do you want to send all those pre-regime uh, change, those personnel to serve as diplomats and, and uh, don't, I don't know whether I can trust them or not, loyalty, all these kind of issues, but, but at least you can see that they expanded. So 22 actually can be a larger numbers, uh, can be even more. But simply, it's just China has a difficulty sending out the diplomats. And then, then since their, their isolationist policy, they, they don't know how to run the international affairs right, to a certain extent. Another thing in terms of uh, INGO, that's a non governmental organization, and Taiwan also faced a crisis. For example, in 1973, UNESCO, which is the one handling all the NGOs, and then under China's pressure, sent out a, 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 a instruction to all the NGOs associated with Taiwan, asking them to cut off the relationship. So in 1973, sent out that particular request. 75, if you check on the documents, uh, in the UNESCO documents, uh, approximately 20 out of the, the 37 reply, okay, majority of them turned down the request, cut off the relation. But eventually they have to cut, cut, down, cut, cut off the relationship. Uh, because China's, if you read in the 1970s UNESCO, UNESCO's document, uh, documents, records, and you're going to see every year China is going to mention it, China is going to mention it, China is going to mention it, and so eventually some of the NGO they, they decide to do so. China's position, I don't need to explain very well or uh, extensively in this case, but the China position is very simple. There is uh, one China policy there is based on the 1992 consensus, uh, that means there's one China with different interpretation, but in the White Papers 19, 1993, they argue that in terms of the IDO representations, Taiwan is supposed to be named Taipei, comma, China, or Taiwan, comma, China. And, and from Taiwan's point of view, certainly that's not acceptable because that treats you just like a local regional unit within the big Chinese, Chinese government. Because 
At this moment in 1993, gradually in terms of the international social construct, China gradually replaced or dominate the name of China. So in that case, certainly from Taiwan's point of view, we say, well, do I really want to put a common or not? So it's a debate about the common. Uh, it's, it's continue going on. Then 2000, they even further, they talk about Chinese Taipei. Because at that time, in 1981, already got the International Olympic Committees, and then they decided to change it in order to accommodate China's needs and all this kind of finally compromising solution. Taiwan was not happy about it, but still accept the Chinese Taipei. So that's the International Olympic Committee, IOC's model. In the NGO, gradually moved into the uh, IGOs. So in 2005 paper, they said Chinese Taipei is only, only an ad hoc arrangement and cannot constitute a model applicable to other IGOs. But then that kind of understanding or that kind of sort of statement actually right now is already no longer there. Because Chinese Taipei, you're going to see a lot. So currently, in terms of status report, Taiwan got 53 IGOs in all different kinds of categories. But if you really count it, they're probably only 44, 45. It depends on how you count it. Uh, because, for example, if you join the World Trade Organization, they have a lot of spin-off organizations. So as long as you're the WTO, then you can get into other international organizations. Okay? Or if you're the World Customs uh, organizations, uh, then in that case, again, they, they set up all kinds of technical standards, committee, or the organization. They, in that case, you can join in. So in terms of 53, 33 of four member status, observer status 16, associate member status 2, corresponding members 1, and then the cooperating non-members, that's 1, that's for the tuna fish. Uh, that's in the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. Actually, that one, have joined very early, but then never really pushing it, because think about that's Atlantic. But even though we love sushi and sashimi, so, <laughs> so we, want, we want to keep, you know, from, there, from, from Taiwan's point of view, I still want to harvest you know, all the fish, all those tuna and fish. I think I'm, I'm coming from a you know, the small fishing town, so sashimi <laughs> actually is, uh, is sort of a really delicious, particularly if you love sushi and sashimi. <laughs> so that one actually, so that organization actually said, well, we still want to keep you here. So it's a cooperating non-member, but still you, you got participation rights and all kinds of discussion, discussion rights. Right down in terms of year, before 2000, you have total 21 full members, observer status seven, corresponding member one, and then cooperating members one. From 2000 to 2008, that's during the transfer period, you increase eight full, full members membership, okay, seven observers and the associate two. After 2008, my angel stepped in, total six, four of them, four uh, members and the observer two. And that's certainly, if I'm getting into the domestic politics, then in that case, if, if I'm the pro-green, and the green, certainly I'm not green, but anyway, if I'm a green members, pan green members, and then I would say, look, since we've been error actually increased tremendously, you're talking about total 17, okay? My angel, you already stepped in. Gee, you're really, not good in terms of diplomatic. You, know, you only got six. And so, so if you compare the number, but you, you, again, don't forget that some of the number actually deceiving. And then sometimes if you really get into the, sorry, is there an Ministry of Foreign Affairs delegate here? Sorry. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> sometimes the number, if you get into, for example, maybe two, uh, 2012, 2013, and you suddenly, Say, well, how come the number increase or decrease? Or, or some, of the, some of the membership becomes full members, some of them become, suddenly becomes observer status. Because there is a certain way you, you can read it. Because some of the full membership actually is not joined in as a national name or national organization or national sort of like a state. Actually, join joined in like some kind of agency. Okay, so there is a possibility, maybe election committee, they join the Asian election committee. Uh, organization or some kind of study, and certainly in that case, maybe the title will be Taiwan. Why? The China is not going to join in. Is that right? So, and then there's another organization called the Government Information Technology, and pretty much talking about government how to control or manage the 
information technology and you're not supposed to do a censorship and all that. So suddenly Taiwan join in. China is not going to join in because China loves its own people very much. They want to well protect it. They don't want you to listen to all, watch all those pornography sites and all this kind of thing. So they, they try to restrict it. So in that case, certainly Taiwan will be able to join. And sometimes even the name, you can find a suitable name in order to do that. Okay. So there, there's all kinds of a trick you play into it. In terms of categorizations, I quickly, majority of them, they are economic trade and finance. So that means, again, think about from Taiwan's point of view. In order to sustain itself, economic development is a, a trading process, financial, all kinds of things is actually very important because you want to catch, catch up the, 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 the train of the globalization. So economic part is definitely Taiwan need to get into it. Then the, the second one will be the rural development, agriculture, animal re related issue. But even for that, sometimes it's very difficult because if, for example, there is a world organization dealing with animal health. And then at one time I was reading the document and someone said studies and, oh, it's re pretty much like a soap opera so going through it because in, in order to get, keep Taiwan, then, then you, you, the organization need to think of some name to accommodate China's needs, and then, but then if you accommodate China's needs too much, and then Taiwan will be kicked out, but on the other hand, Taiwan is a long-term member. So for animals' health issues, it's very important to keep Taiwan, because we all love that kind of cutie cutie uh, animal. So you know, how are you going to do it? It becomes a long-term history of the diplomatic exchange in order to keep Taiwan, but at the same time also get China into it. And then the, the third, third category actually quite Interesting, that's a fishing related. And this part in recent development is quite interesting. Taiwan joined as a fishing entity. I don't know what that means, but anyway. Fishing entity, that means it's based on the UNCRO, United Nations Law of the Sea Convention 1982. There's Article 305. Uh, I think they, they try to encourage the broad participation. So they indicate that member states Okay, you can join, of course. On the other hand, if you're the so-called non-self-governing territorial entity, or maybe you're the self-governing entity, but you're not recognized by others, we also welcome you to join, but certainly with a kind of special consideration. So UNCRO as Law of the Sea in 1982 opened up that, that, that kind of possibility. In 1995, UN fish stock, fish stocks, Agreement also opened up the possibility. Article, Article 1, 2, and 6, they, again, they say, well, if certain country they cannot join as an official name, we are trying to find some way to allow them to join. And they, they put out the name, fishing entity. So there is a possibility. That, that's exactly what the fishing entity in Atlant Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, particularly in the Western and Pacific Ocean, that part, because that's pretty much on, on Taiwan's uh, coastal areas. And then a lot of Taiwan's blue water uh, flee. They really catch a lot. Okay, so that that's, that increased the Taiwan's participation because it's using the fishing entity, and because Taiwanese also love fish and also maybe harvest a lot export for you know, for export purpose. So in that case, if I'm the fishing entity, certain I mean if fishing fishery management organizations, I certainly want to keep Taiwan in. And China also realized that. So there's the point is how are you going to negotiate? And that's that's certainly that's a separate subjects, uh, I, I, I'll deal with it. And then you can see all kinds of, but then you're going to see that only six of them, they are general in other areas. That means in terms of election, in terms of integration, and that one, for example, Latin America, Central America, that, that kind of integration organization, they can join because most of the Taiwan's allies, they are there, diplomatic allies. Are there. So there's no problem to join. Okay. But the point is, most of them, they are technical issue, regional issue, functional issues but not so much in terms of political issues. The foremost of, of participation, this one, I'm going to run through very quickly. That's a, you got the full membership, you got associate members, you got the observer status, and then you have the uh, course, corresponding members, okay, and you have a cooperating non-members, uh, meaning that they, they still want you to be informed, even though you're not a member, but because of your activity here. So you have all this kind of uh, a membership. Taiwan's goal certainly is try to get into a full members, but in order to get into four members, you need, uh, you, you need to get China's approval, either in the taxi way or the obvious way to say, well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to allow you to get in. Once they allow you to get in, then you have to think about what's in the name, uh, allow you to, to join in. 
So you have all different kinds of tricks. Uh, try, to, try to get into it. Then the examples of official name, okay. uh, here I can read some of you. You join this Republic of China, it's in the past, you can join in. And it also depends on whether, 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 uh, whether China is really interested in the organization or not. So the possibility, you join in as a Republic of China, but one day you're going to see that they change your name in a quiet way. Or maybe in, in a way, just announce it to you, take it or leave it. Okay, there's a possibility. You can join this at, at, at Taiwan's name, but again, uh, again, you know, that, that also creates a problem of it. You can have a Taipei common China, or sometimes even Taipei without common in China. I don't know what, what I, mean. I, I need to find a linguistic specialist to try to decide it. You have a Chinese Taipei, you have customer territory, you have an economic entity, you have a fishing entity, you have a health entity, and then you can join as a participating organization, just like an international satellite for research and the rescue. Actually, let's join as a, some kind of semi-official organization for some kind of rescue business, but there's an international organization, and then that's also the catchy part. You don't know whether that's really officially an IGO or INGO. Uh, it's the identity crisis, not only for Taiwan, but also for that particular organization. So you, you have all different kinds of ways to get into it. Taiwan's policy actually since roughly maybe 21st century gradually changed. What Taiwan wants to do with this, I use for Taiwan's international functionality and sustainability because no country, just like no individual, is an island. No, Taiwan certainly is an island. But then, you know, I, I, even though I'm an island, I want to have some kind of continental association of it. You know, you don't want to feel lonesome. You know, just like uh, occasionally, I need to talk to someone. You know, so that, that kind of uh, that kind of association value actually is quite important because of, through association, you can find a lot of information. You can also connect it. You can build up. Facebook, sometimes you still need to have that kind of connection. You know, that's the purpose of the Facebook. Not only simply just put it on a face, you need to have a book to collect all those names. So, so you, you, you try to have a sustainability, you, you try to have a functionality of, of, of Taiwan. Because Taiwan really cannot simply just close up. You, you need to move out. You need to get in the international organization first and see what to do next. So pragmatic uh, principles becomes very important. We can negotiate the name. Okay. We can also talk about what kind of rights I have. Okay. So even observer status is, is acceptable. So that, that's the purpose of trying to get in. Then in terms of the name, what's in the name? You can play the semantic games. Okay. You can call me Republic of China, come on Taiwan or Taiwan. Or you can say, well, you don't like Taiwan, Republic of China, but at least I want to have a Chinese Taipei or any kind of name. But don't put me into Taiwan, come on China or Taipei, come on China. Because there's a domestic issue over there, and that becomes a crucial one. Okay, so there's a, a spectrum of what what you, know, you they prefer and what they don't prefer. They also soften the na narrative appeal. In other words, again coming back to constructive, discursive uh, that kind of strategy, they simply just emphasize on international participation, but they don't talk about full membership. So that has been the Guo Ji Chinese. That's we keep on talking. I just want to join in. Okay. Maybe I don't have a voting right, but at least I need to raise my concern. Uh, it's just like International Civil, Civil Aviation as, uh, uh, Association or ICA organizations. I don't want to find out all those air traffic standards six months later or one year later, even though the ICA already changed the standard and I have no idea. So sort of when, when the foreign pilot coming in landed in Taoyuan International Airport, they talk one language and they say, yes, that's English, but what does that mean? So it, it, it really tries to be connected to the international standard. So international participation is, is very important, and at the same time, they use an NGO to complement it. NGO becomes a crucial one. If IGO doesn't work, NGO cut in. So sometimes NGO it, it becomes more useful. What I'm saying in terms of the China's interest, you can allow Taiwan to get in, and then you can manipulate, maneuver in the name a little bit. The purpose is you want to use the naming for the social construction in the international arena, but at the same time for the domestic consumption. When I say domestic consumption, it's not only in Taiwan, but also in China, both. Okay? 
International is social construct construction is we all understand that anyone try and stay abroad for a long time, just like me, 80s. I went to the United States and said, someone asked me, so where are you from? I said, from Taiwan. So are you a Chinese or not, or Taiwanese? I said, of course I'm a Chinese. I don't know. No argument about it, because we have been social constructed in that way. And then gradually you say, well, am I really Chinese? Because if I mention I'm a Chinese, I'm, I'm coming from people's Republic of China, but I'm, I'm holding Taiwan's passport. So what should I say? So everyone asked me, and they said, in late 1980, I said, yeah, I'm a Chinese, but I'm from Taiwan. But you know, politically, I'm, I'm uh, from Taiwan. And culturally, maybe, you know, historically, so it's, it becomes a complicated issue. Then, continue process, because China refused to allow Taiwan to call the Republic of China. That's very simple. So when you talk about People's Republic of China, and then the abbreviation will be China, and then suddenly you will say, well, China equivalent to People's Republic of China. So all see simply just disappear in the international society. And so when, when they ask you again, you say, where are you from? I'm from Taiwan. Uh, are, you, are you a Taiwanese? Yeah, yeah Taiwanese, yeah. I, I don't want to have a you know, bipolar, that kind of uh, identity <laughs> crisis. And, uh, and also I need to spend a lot of time there. So look at, the, look at that kind of a situation. That kind of situation actually create an international social construct. Either self-push out, or maybe self-push out, that means domestic politics, because the Lee way errors uh, if, if you don't love Taiwan, so you have to shout every morning three times saying, I love Taiwan. And so the purpose is, actually that's quite useful for a democratic transition. But then sometimes, if Taiwan has no diplomatic issues, so that, that's, a, that's a good point. But then you know, sometimes you, you create a problem that for, for yourself. You already remodel yourself, reconstruct yourself. So that's the international. It, it, I, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm, I'm a Chinese in, in that way. I'll simply just say Taiwanese. That's, that's easy. Otherwise, I need to spend 10 minutes to explain the history and political consideration of it. Okay. So that, that's really for the international purpose. If, if you get Taiwan in, and then you can construct a name, you can call either face the Republic of China, that's a perfect solution. Okay. Or if maybe you modify, you say Chinese Taipei. At least you got the Chinese over there. And then you got Taipei to satisfy Taiwan's side. You got Chinese over there, and then think about it. If you repeat 100 times every morning, Chinese Taipei, Chinese Taipei, you become a Chinese. Is that right? It's just look at the face. Every face will be a Chinese. So, so that's it. And then, then the second thing is, the, for China, bring Taiwan in. Because you really, if you read the International Foundation, it doesn't need to be a full member. And then some of the constitution, because at one time I was in China and Beijing with uh, international law scholars, and then he keep on saying that, but you know, constitution, I mean, the IGO constitutional treaty say very clearly membership is this. But I said, I have two arguments. One, there must be some of the provisions sometimes they talk about associate members, okay? Or sometimes not listed over there, but sometimes they create observer status, okay? So there's a possibility, one. Secondly, even though the, the treaty provision is so strict, well, we all understand international politics. If there's a will, there's a way. Palestinian liberation organizations or different organizations, some of the organizations during the decolonization period, they haven't participated in the United Nations, but they're already a member of the IGO. So what happens? Well, just general assembly or any kind of general conference, is just like, a, for example, UNESCO, 2011, they just passed a motion. They said, well, Palestinian, you're a state member. And then United States say, oh, gosh. So refuse to pay the deal. The United States pay 22% of it. And then exceeding two years, so 2013, United States already exceeded. So the United States voting right in the events to say bye-bye. We got that following the Constitution. So in that case, look. A lot of international organizations, if you're creative enough, if you have a political will, if China is waiting to accept it, actually, it's, it's not really a problem. Even the Rosalind Pickens, uh, the, 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 some of the uh, ICJ's uh, judge, they even, he, she even said that, oh, all these are political considerations. Okay, so that, that's not a problem. So bring it in, even that's non-sovereign members, 
because we only ask for international participation. International participation has all kinds of activity going on, so bring in. Third thing is Chinese Taipei actually is a very good compromising solution at this moment. I say at this moment, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will please everyone. Okay, so because Taiwan domestic politics, even for some of the blue, pen blue members, they probably, if I'm a die hard blue member, I would say, well, I want the Republic of China. I really want it. Okay, so I, I don't want Chinese Taipei. Because think about Chinese Taipei. It, it, I just mentioned, if you repeat 100 times, does that mean Chinese Taipei eventually becomes a name, becomes a national title? <laughs> and in fact, some scholars already warned about it. But on the other hand, you retreat it from the realist point of view and try to accommodate the liberalist point of view. If they're willing to take you, well, Chinese Taipei may be not a bad, I say not a bad solution for the timing. But once you get in, maybe there is all kinds of possibility over there. So Chinese Taipei for the PRC, because there is a Chinese over there, there is a Taipei over there, so both sides are a little bit half, uh, half in a way that happy to some extent, not completely satisfactory. The final thing is, if you're the strong versus the weak, again, strong, you can use the military forces for unification, but you really don't want to see it, uh, particularly for China's point of view. If you want to prove yourself, you, you, you are benevolent, rising power, and then you say, well, I'm being benevolent on one hand, on the other hand, I kick your butts. You know, no, that's probably not, not friendly in a sense. So what you can do is you accommodate. And the point is you try to bring it in, lock it, because we're locking that position. And then I just mentioned that you, you, that's a non-sovereign member. You can create this observer right, just like the United States asking the ICAO to give a Palestinian organizations a, some kind of observer status in the ICAO in 1974, put up, put up one condition. Palestinian organization or authority or the government, they cannot become a full member. If they want to become a member, full members, the United States is going to block it. So 1989, Palestinian organization tried to change it. U.S. seems to block it. You can put it in, in some kind of memorandum writings, uh, which happens in different organizations. So this is uh, a 2008. Uh, that's done by the National Zhengzi University election studies. That, that's the only one I can find it uh, in terms of the preference over Taiwan's official delegations or the titles in IGO. That's 2008. And that's a survey. They give all kinds of choice of name to the survey subject. And then everyone answer which one you choose. And you, you can only choose one. 29.2% 2 in 2008, they choose Republic of China. 437 they choose Taiwan. Chinese Taipei, only 7.4%. And then the rest of them will be common. Taiwan, China, or any name, or others. Or some of them, they don't care. That's 5.2%. Okay, this is the first question they ask. So you can see that Republic of China or Taiwan, Taiwan actually 43%. Republic of China, 29.2%. But if you ask a follow-up question, if ROC or Taiwan are not acceptable, are not likely to happen, what's the name you, you prefer? Okay, and then the Taiwan, common China, 4.6%. 52.1%, they choose Chinese Taipei. Okay. Either one is fine, that's 9.7%. Neither one is okay, that would be 28.5%. No response, again, still about 5%, 5.1%, because those people, they don't care, so. But then the question is really comes in. ROC, Taiwan, not acceptable. You know, what's the follow-up option? What's the step-back option? You say, well, Chinese Taipei. Okay, and this, this one is interesting. Then after this one, we, we, we have a group we try to convince some of the surveys. Since if you want to do a survey, that's quite expensive. Uh, then for American professors, just like the English colleagues, you know, we are all very poor. We cannot <laughs> get on it unless we have a funding. So anyway, so we are poor folks. And then, so we try to run the survey again, but we couldn't find anyone is willing to survey because this is an international issue. They are more interesting about whether the someone can, can win the, uh, uh, the, the doctors or not, all this kind of issue, or maybe they are more interesting about any kind of soap opera stars, you know, whatever. But anyway, so this issue. But look, look at, that's 2008, Chinese Taipei, 52.1%. So there's a possibility over there. 
Then another one actually is not coming from the same organization called, so I, and, and also uh, I don't know too much about this one. This is the, from Yuan Zhazi, that's the Taiwan Indicator Survey Research in 20, 2013 in October, they re released one, only one. Here is they saying, what's the province of over Taiwan's official delegation in IGO? And they asked the, the survey uh, uh, subject and said, well, but you, you can have a multiple choice. This is different from the previous, previous one. You said you can only choose one. This one, you can have a multiple uh, preferences uh, choice. Republic of China, 72.5%. Taiwan, 78.9%. Chinese Taipei, 25.8% uh, 25 only. But you can have all kinds of choice. So that means, again, Chinese Taipei actually is not highly preferred. But you now, Republic of China, 72.5%. Taiwan, actually, 78.9%. The another one they, they run through is they decided to do the, the cross finding for pen blue. That means they are more on the KMT side or that kind of pen blues. Uh, actually, my mind is I decided to take off the color because even though in London you know, I visit all different museums, it's quite colorful. You know, but then I'm afraid that if you put color into it and then I put the red, then that means I'm pro PRC. I put the blue, and then all those major colors I cannot choose. So. <laughs> So sometimes it's a difficult issue, so I'm colorblind. So pen blue is a Republic of China. For pen blue, they, they, they choose the Republic of China. 88.3%, certainly that's, that's their, their inspiration of it. Taiwan, 75.3% of it. Pen green, they'll choose the Republic of China. Still surprisingly, 69.1%. Taiwan, 91.5%, that's not, not surprising. By this, you, you can see that there is some kind of merging uh, consensus, emerging consensus is the Republic of China actually is, uh, is, is, is suddenly becomes uh, acceptable, particularly for pink green on uh, that side. Yeah, pink blue, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt about it, but yeah, pink green, that's, that side is and sort of, a, because some of the pink green, that political leader, they also, for example, Sun Minder will come out and say, well, why do we need to declare independence? You know, there's no point. Well, why do we need to do it? Because we're already a country, why we need to do it? So to bypass that particular, uh, particular way. And that kind of argument actually also come in in the follow-up, the same survey released, even though I, I don't know the detail of how, how they conduct this survey. If China accepts the ROC on Taiwan, is there a need to change the national title for independence? That's October 11th, uh, 2013, so they you can find it in, in the website. No need to change, 73.3%. Okay. So that means also another message. And that, that's probably also the Lian Zhan's recent meetings and also they say, well, please acknowledge the existence of the Republic of China. And then you can talk about mutual non-denial principles, which is just like East Germany and the West Germany when they decided to sign the basic treaty in 1972. Actually, very similar, uh, very similar situation. And at the same time, if you go back to read some, uh, sorry, I, I cannot qualify to, to be a European, so sorry if there is a specialist on the German unification. Uh, I have to confess, I apologize for it. But at, at least before the German unification at that time, the survey is also very similar, and it's not similar, in, in an interesting, a lot of West Germ German people's attitude is, I don't care about East German, and uh, so the attitude is, very similar, just like uh, Taiwan's that kind of division. They say, well, oh, look, who cares about China? Or maybe some of them say, well, I care about China. And so the kind of division, identity division, still there. But then suddenly, political entrepreneurs' point of view coming in, political leaders say, well, push, pushing it, we need to. Because in the 1972 basic treaty, actually, you know, talking about Germany as a whole, they never mentioned who is going to unify what. They, they, they decided to set up a permanent missions in each country, they don't call it uh, official diplomat representative. Okay, they are going to set up a like a permanent mission in each uh, so-called respective government government seat. They don't use capital. Okay, so it, it's the way they try to do it, and that's actually what maybe my NGO, or maybe the maybe the, they don't know when the when the DPP gained power, which is likely, and then they probably they, they, they probably will do the same thing. Uh, that, that, that's the interesting part. They, they, you try to fuzzy it and then blur it. It's just like impressionists. I, I, I was watching the Turner's uh, impressionist, older age. Uh, in the National Gallery, there is a train and the steam coming in. So it's the impressionists coming in. So what should China do very quickly? China and Taiwan in, in an asymmetrical situation, my, my argument with China needs to do more. 
And actually, you're not afraid of the Taiwan anymore, is that right? You have the aircraft carriers over there, you can keep on playing with it, and you're already a big toy. So play with it. You don't need to worry about Taiwan, Taiwan actually since 1975 already changed, you know, 75, 74 at that time, during the Jiang period already changed the military strategy. It's a defensive purpose, not an offensive purpose. So you don't need to win and think about it in Taiwan and say one day it's going to land it and then uh, put a flag into it. Uh, don't think about it. So, but, but the point is, if you're strong, you need to accommodate the purposes for, for the long run. You want to bring it in, lock it in, rope it in. And then once you lock in the position, you undercut yourself. Similar kind of argument, just like the United States after 1945. Set up all kinds of international organizations, set up the Bretton Woods system, all kinds of things. You know, I say, say, well, I'm a strong. I decide to carry the responsibility. But the, po the point is, I understand that my, he my hegemonic status probably will not last very long. By this, I can create an institutional rule. And so if maybe one day I step down, my rules continue to live and then will constrain the state's behavior. So that's a private challenge I need to think that way. Though all the sovereignty sensitivity issue try to be very pragmatic in name and membership, actually China already started to do it. But they simply just worry Taiwan's regime. They really worry about it. Uh, and then so that, that's a, and suddenly again, you, you also need to come back from the realist point of view. They do have a power consideration. You cannot deny that if I'm a powerful, I'm a strong one, I suddenly will become very bossy and bully around. Okay, so that there's a problem. So, but the, my point is, if there is a will, there is a possibility. Okay, and then finally, mutual non-denial principle actually probably is you know, supposedly the way keep on pushing for it, even though China never accepted, officially, never accepted. Uh, frankly speaking, I haven't seen, uh, unless you, you see something uh, from China saying we accept it. So I acknowledge the possibility, acknowledge the ROC on Taiwan. If full membership is unattainable, I would say, well, they only ask for international participation. Observers, status, Observer, all the other non full members usually they don't have the voting rights. By this, they can sit in over there, they can listen, and sometimes they even got the, 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 you know, they can participate in the discussion. And then that's useful in the sense that you got association, you got legitimacy, you got representation, you got transparency, uh, accountability over there, and compliance can be done in a way that and you bring in the happy family of a global society. Is that right? So, so in that case, everyone can jump around and they're happy. So, so that's the point. If full membership is not attainable, all kinds of ways you can do it. Okay. The, another interesting point is, is the final point I'm going to talk about is the, I just mentioned about all kinds of entity. Health entity, the World Health uh, Assembly, then you have the economic entity to some degree in different kinds of economic organizations. You've got fishing entity, which is quite fascinating. Uh, because I, I just conducted one, one uh, recently and I was reading it. In the treaty, in one fish, you know, f fishery management organization, in the treaty actually say very clearly, it say, need to be state, okay? But then because they have a contract party supposed to be state, but then they, the contract party, they have a one year, everyone get together in a cocktail and they join together, the but they do have a commission to run the fishery management. That's more on the, so the monthly or maybe regular meeting of it. But in the commission rules of procedure, they never specify who are supposed to be the member of it. They only say, well, if you're the contract party, you can join in. But they never rule out that sometimes they can invite maybe other countries to join in. So there's one fishery management organization what they, they decided to do is say, well, UN already indicated that fishing entity is supposed to be invited, that's one. Second, we are dealing with the common pool of resource problem. Okay, like a, sort of like a global commons, but then it, someone will say it's a little bit different. But common pool of uh, resources, just like a fishery, a uh, fish, okay, it, it can be exhausted, it can be subtracted. So you need to have some kind of management of it. So we, we are concerned about that because we really want to keep the sushi sub, uh, survive you know, all the time for the diet. So what they decided to do is they, they are not touching the, the treaty. Contract parties requirements there. Okay? What they change is they change the rule of the procedure. Because rule of procedure also doesn't say how are you going to change it. So what they change it is Taiwan can become not a, a contract party of the whole organization in the treaties uh, definition. But Taiwan invited the observer, 
for the whole treaty, but in terms of the meeting procedure, commission, Taiwan is an official member in the commission. Very easy it can be done. If there is no requirements, three-fourths or four-fifths four and all these kind of things, and then you don't need to be a state, you know, so, you know, so, so Taiwan just got in. And so what Taiwan got in, what they, they decided, also decided to accommodate, say, well, Taiwan made a statement. I have a willing, I have a voting right in the commission meeting, okay, I can do it, I can participate in the meeting, blah, blah, all this kind of thing. But, but if one day the whole treaties organization, they decide to change a policy, you need to inform me, and I have the right to decide whether I want to comply with it or not. And everyone said, yes. So it's finished. And then it, 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 it becomes a formality. How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it is, do you want to put it in the treaty annex? So sometimes we call, you know, put it in the whole treaty. Since you don't want to change the treaty, change the treaty too much trouble. So you annex it, additional document attach it. That's one, one way they decided to do it. Okay. And then another way they decided, they, they didn't touch anything. They just changed the rule of procedure, that's it. So everyone had it. So Taiwan, it's, it's, it's a kind of strange. You are not a treaty contracting party, but you are a member of a commission, which, which is really wrong. For example, how, 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 much, how, much, what, how much in terms of what, what amount of fish stock you can catch for, example, for your country. And Taiwan even enjoy that kind of reciprocal right. I can send in my Coast Guard and uh, uh, visit or inspect your boat. And then, uh, and then uh, but, but there's all kinds of ways you can do it. So that, that's really my point is, if, if I were in, in Chinese government, so I'm not, since I'm a Taiwanese. So, so, but China really can do a lot. That kind of argument, I, I, again, I need to put a, a damp on the, that kind of uh, aspiration. Last summer I was in, in Shanghai and talking to them, and then I was dip, like a devil's advocate. And finally I realized, uh, well, Shanghai is different from, uh, you got Beijing, you got Shanghai, you got Xiamen. That's three Taiwan affairs. Xiamen is very liberal, but Xiamen, no one listened to them. because, uh, <laughs> But they, they are quite liberal. They, they really have a, a lot of ideas. Okay. Beijing is very conservative to some extent, you know, more, more dogmatic, because you, know, you cannot deny they, they, they live in the capitals and everyone is watching, so, you, you know, so very, very, very slow conservative. Shanghai is in, the, in between. So I was talking to them, and they eventually said, well, two things we, we worry about. It. One thing we do worry about the DPP will come to power. And I said, well, you cannot. But Taiwan is a democratic society. That's the price of a de democratic society. You have to deal with it. But even for that, with the division in terms of identity, it's also unlikely for DPP to push very far for their position. On the other hand, that also means that my angel actually is hands are tied. He's not, uh, particularly if you know him, uh, I, don't, I don't know him, sorry. But you know, his men, uh, mentality is he followed the constitution and all this kind of thing, you know, like uh, all kinds of scholars, you know, they're probably doing all kinds of things. So you, you don't expect my angel is going to say, well, not like jogging, but then he, he's going to have a gigantic uh, great leap forward. I mean, no, it's, it's not likely because Taiwan's domestic politics is like that way. You can blame my angel for all kinds of things, but then you expect him to be the, vanguards and all kind of things, you know, well, you know, that, that's not like, so in Taiwan's domestic policy, but Beijing does worry about the DPP coming to power. And if the DPP becomes power, then if that person is like a Chen Shui-bian, then oh, that's a big headache. Everyone is going to have a white hair like me and then they have loose sleeves and then all that kind of thing. So that's one. Second thing they also worry, I'll see if gain some kind of acknowledgement, gain some kind of equal status. Think about it, if, if you're the strong, how are you going to swallow it? I'm the boss, I'm the strong, I actually can do whatever I want to do. Okay, that's like a million dollar. The strong can do whatever you want to do. Sorry, if you're the weak, you have to suffer whatever you need to suffer. That's, that's a political reality. So they have that kind of mentality. They say, well, yeah, we try, but you know, and I say, so what? I say, well, why do I need to accommodate your needs? The situation already changing, ties reverse. If that's in 1980s, you probably think called a shock. But sorry, 1990, things even when lost the opportunity, he decided not to push it forward. It's our time to call a shock. So it's a shifting position becomes difficult.
I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wow, you covered a lot, lot of ground there, a huge Sorry. number of, um, of issues. I, mean, um, I guess I, I share some very similar experiences in, in, in some of my conferences in, uh, in, in, the, in the PRC. And when I first started going back to the PRC in 2009, um, when the DVP was probably at its lowest point, one of the things that really shocked me was how, um, how paranoid they were about the DVP coming back to power. Um, at that time, it seemed like the DVP would, was uh, almost finished. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I've also often uh, said is, is the constraints that, that the DP was under, even when it was in power. And similarly, I think you're right that, that Mindjo faces similar constraints. Um, we often hear this, this idea that, that Taiwan is a very divided society. Mm -hmm. But I thought one of the things I thought was really interesting in your presentation was the, the, the survey data, which actually suggests a lot of uh, consensus on um, uh, which looks a bit different from what we see in, in, in Parliament. Um, but the, uh, the question I wanted to ask was, to what extent, from, from your understanding, do Taiwanese voters still care much about international space? Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you think back to the 1990s, this was a really big thing. Right. Um, and this is something that helped the government get re-elected so, uh, so easily. Um, what, what about now? From, um, do you see any, any major shift there? I, 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 right now, the issue actually is no longer so important in terms of voters' money. They probably care more about whether Jason one is winning or not winning, or the current uh, is really going to run as a uh, non party affiliated kind of candidates, and the particular election process goes on. But then, even if that international space is not, but then international space issue actually connected to identity politics. So, anytime you got identity politics, suddenly they are going to play it. It doesn't matter which side. Yeah, that's so attractive, uh, really attractive in terms of the campaign issue. You know, it's allow you to anything you throw in. You say, for example, I'm, I'm sure that maybe when Nelson or other uh, come, come they're, going to, they're going to say that well, your daddy is pro China and all that kind of things, and then connect it say you are pro China and all kind of issue, and then then the. Green, for example, Cohen's uh, probably the, the Dr. Kirk probably would say, well, I'm really non-party affiliated and I really want to work for the city guard. But in Taiwan, you, you all understand, even though that's a lower level, city level type, you know, they, 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 they'll talk about the, you know, the national or some kind of identity issue on higher levels. Even though I'm a city mayor, I really don't deal with that kind of issue. But then they, they still bring it because there, there's all kinds of issues. I still think the identity issue is not so dramatic just like before. That's one. The second, the international space issue is no longer so, uh, in terms of media, publicity no longer so obvious. But just watch out. If, if there is a one kind of, you know, something that Taiwan was kicked out from one international organization or another issue like a Gambia coming on it, and I sh I'm, I'm sure just like, uh, 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 British on that suddenly say, well, there's an issue over there. My nose will smell something good, and then I'll simply just exploit. Because I don't care. I just need to have three days publicity. We have first day expose it, second day they re reply, and third day I still keep on beating it. And then another thing is, you know, so any kind of issue will keep on coming back. So there's certainly a possibility of it. Okay, uh, question. You all like my students? No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. Take it back. Um, what impact has Xi Jinping's um, accession had on the Straits relations? Is he pushing more towards um, taking more of that uh, intangible space, or is he pushing kind of a more military? For Taiwan? Mm. I don't think he. he no, oh, I think. <laughs> no, I. Uh, 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 Xi Jinping's policy toward Taiwan is certainly. If you compare him with uh, Hu Jintao, uh, certainly he is more hands on. He probably knows more because his previous experience, that's one. And secondly, secondly, he also got involved in the PR, PRA very, very early period, so he can also control it. Well, I, I, I have to admit that I don't know him too much, so I really cannot. The only thing I made a comment one time, I was talking to a China think tank person, I said, 
since he mentioned about Chinese, China twin, and then suddenly in Shanghai, for example, when I visit Shanghai, everyone is writing grants for dreaming, China twin. And I say, oh, you're a dreamer. <laughs> so the, the grant title would say, How to Pursue China Dream. China Dream. And I say, it's very easy. Just sit there, asking my student, they're doing the daydream, and then they're going to dream in China, and then they're just putting on all kinds of things. A lot of a project actually about China Dream, because that's, that's the style. So I think he probably got a stronger na nationalistic aspiration to really push China to be strong. And they, that part actually for most of the Chinese, that's understandable. Right? If you are being educated in the Chinese history, the century of uh, humi uh, humiliations and all this kind of, all because of Great Britain and uh, causing all these troubles. And, but on the other hand, that's good to some extent. You defeated us and so right now we need to be strong. So, that kind of mentality, historical legacy over there, the nationalistic feeling actually quite nice. So, but then on the other hand, you can see that kind of continuity. Uh, look, you, you, you look at the Diao Yitai, Sengkaku Islands. Suddenly China becomes so assertive. And someone asking why, and then someone explaining it's because 2009, uh, Xi Jinping and Bo Xilai, because Bo Xilai is pushing red in Sichuan and all that kind of things, and then there are all kinds of debate. And so Hu Jintao at that time feel that, gosh, you know, that kind of issue, he, he's talking, just like competition, that kind of political leader competition. So when Bo Xilai gained all those publicity and talking about red, talking about nationalism, and then all that. So Hu Jintao has to do something to compete, otherwise I'm not, because Bo Xilai really moving up in terms of that kind of public approval. So for, for Hu Jintao, even, even though I, sometimes I think Hu Jintao is more like a technocrat and that kind of things, and they, but they still, you have to do something. And then that, that trend suddenly continue. And I, I thought at that time probably Xi Jinping probably will lower that kind of situation, you know, but still continue, so that probably tells you something. But I have to say that I, I don't know him. Even though I ask all my Chinese friends, scholars, so sometimes it's difficult to say. So sorry, no answer. Yeah, B. Sorry. Uh, I just wonder, um, it seemed to me that uh, you held quite a, what optimistic view on uh, Taiwan's strategy in you know, exploring all of ch revenues and different kind of um, uh, secret passage, get into different uh, uh, international organizations. I just wonder, what's your view on the future? Uh, you know, you can see foreseeable future that's probably change your power. Well, will that affect or have any effect on uh, Taiwan's diplomatic strategies or just carry on as usual? Uh, first of all, in terms of optimistic, the reason I'm a little bit optimistic is because I thought, oh, if I'm coming from China's side, just like every scholar, you step in that position, you sort of excited. Look, this is the way it's supposed to go. But in certain, no one followed. Is that right? We're always a lonely voice shouting. The sound of music is sometimes is very lonely. So, so that's optimistic in a sense. Is I say, well, previous I, I, I really don't think this issue very important from my point of view. Because I say, well, what can you do? That, that's the situation. But I, I, I reverse the position. I say, well, on the other hand, from China's point of view, actually they can do a lot. And then that's why in, the, in my discussion with me, my, I'm sort of becomes a little bit passionate in a sense. But then they say, oh gosh, you're defending Taiwan. I say, well, but I'm looking from your point of view. If your goal is unification or peaceful revolution, not necessarily unification, Peaceful revolution. Certainly, you can do a military solution. But if you're peaceful revolution, whatever the result, and you also also both sides argue one China with different interpretation, and in that case, there is a possibility over there. But then I'm sure as, I, as the ending, I give you a, a, put a, a little bit wet towel on your on everyone's head. I say, well, but then it's a realist consideration is still there. If I'm strong, why do I need to bargain? But on the other hand, I still remember Rousseau at one time, even though I forget whatever Rousseau said, talk about it for a long time. But Rousseau, I just mentioned about million dialogue. He says, strong can do whatever you want to do. The weak, you must suffer whatever you need to suffer. And don't talk about the rights, neutrality, forget about friendship, alliances, depend on others. Self-help is the most important. But on the other hand, Rousseau would say, 
Even for the strongest, you're never so strong if you don't have uh, that kind of sense of right. Because power still eventually coming down. You need to have a sense of justice. Mm. Otherwise, you cannot, you cannot holding the strong arms or any kind of weapon stand behind everyone and say, obey me. So still, sometimes you need to be a little bit shrewd, diplomatic, skillful, mm. convinced that this is the right way to do it. And that's why United States, for example, or, or Great Britain, the same thing. You, you set up the empire, you set up the empire, you set up the rules. And when you set up the rules, you need to compromise. Suddenly, you take care of your interests, and you create all those fancy, flowery discourse, and say, oh, free trade is good. Actually, free trade is really good, but it doesn't matter. You say, free trade is good. Allow everyone to believe into it, so one day, you, you don't really need to use the physical forces to enforce it. They're already in their mindset. They follow your rule. That's why I love Great Britain. You, know, you go to a national gallery and say, wow. I'll go to Tate Britain's and I say, wow. Okay. All this kind of wow, wow, wow comes in. And then it becomes really a sense that you believe that there must be some sense of justice, righteous action, behavior, patterns. And they, we are willing to accept your leadership. The same thing just like the United States. So that, that, that's, that, that's the point I, I really want to carry. So in terms of future, I don't know. If I know, I'll be Nobel Peace Prize. And actually, now very difficult to get a Nobel Peace Prize, as long as political scientists recommend. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, okay. Hi, you assume like China's strength as a, as a realist, but given the CCP will never be elected, do you ever think they can be really secure and really... Oh, that's, that's that? another issue, yes. I think that Taiwan, for example, I mean, there always be such an intrinsic issue to their security, and if they ease up at all, I mean, they see it as a weakness, and then you have domestic forces that respond to that. You mean the, which side ease up? Um, the CCP, for example. They start easing up towards the Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. And then Taiwan. And then it's not even Taiwan. It's mainly, I think it's domestic, isn't it? It's like people yeah, also questioning right. their rules. So. That's, that has been the debate in, in China study for a long time. You know, someone would say, China is very strong, China, and then someone would say, no, 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 yeah, it's only on the outside, but they look at the inside. And that, that's so, certainly also true. You, you, don't need, you, you don't need to go through, just like it, most of you probably already visit China. We all understand that if you're on the coastal areas and Shanghai, you say, ah, I still love it because the pub, the nightlife, and all kinds of things. <laughs> but if you get into the inner land, and sometimes you wonder, is, is this China? Okay. I went to Tibet and uh, passing through some of the uh, other areas, and you keep on wondering, is, and then the Tibetan people will talk about different kind of view. And you say, oh, if I'm wrong in China, uh, I'm going to have a lot of aspirants uh, every night. Mm -hmm. of value. Uh, otherwise, I cannot sleep very well. So the, the, the question is, looking from this side, outside you say, very nice. Inside, probably a different view. That, that's certainly true. And uh, I think China also realized that. Yeah, they, they really realized that. And so, so Wen Jiabao had one particular uh, interesting uh, comment. and said, well, any kind of issue, any kind of benefits China has, it's just divided by 1.3 billion population, the benefits for each individual becomes very small. Okay? Any kind of problems, and uh, you say, well, it's small, but then put it into China, times 1.3. <laughs> it's a big one. So it, it's really, and, and I think they, they understand it, uh, that kind of issue. But then the question is, and I, I remember another story, Deng Xiaoping at one time, uh, mentioned that, that again. I, I don't know whether true. Someone told me that when in 19, late nineteen eighties and uh, early nineteen nineties at that time, there there was some discussion from KMD Chen Li Fu at one time mentioned that. Well, how about this? We we are we are wealthy enough in terms of economic wealth, and so why don't we just divide the one part of southern part of China and let us run, test it, Taiwan's model, okay, and then you you. you then you can keep the majority of them, and then we'll see the experiment is good or not, and then eventually maybe a lot of people will come to Taiwan this, this, this side. And then if we're not, if we fail, then, you know, I think I'll be replied, see. Uh, not a good idea. If you want to run China such a big country, you need to have a CP, CCP. Why? You don't listen to me? Oh. <laughs> Solve the problems. Do I need to convince you? Uh, the reason is, 
I don't do this and I try to give you all those kind of explanations. You also understand that Chinese, just like Taiwanese, are quite realistic. The reason I show you that particular survey data, you want to be to have all the yes, Taiwan, yes. But if all see in Taiwan is not there, well fine, Chinese Taiwan. <laughs> okay, that, I'm not I'm not there's a national security survey Emerson run. If China attack Taiwan, are you willing to defend uh, Vietnam? If, if, if China decides to use uh, military forces and all, all kinds of things, are you willing to defend it? Yes! But if the military forces really invade it, do you want to defend it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so which one do you want to it? <laughs> so if talking, find things, and then, then reality comes in. So. But coming back to your point, yes, China, that, that's, you know, because sometimes if you travel over there, you really sense the urgency, but then you don't know how to solve the problem. Because if you push for democratic election, we all know democracy, democratization, sometimes is a long-term process. And that's why some of the PhD trained in the United States, in the United States, for example, they, they went back and they said, no, no democracy. Authoritarian regime, actually, is good. Benevolent authoritarian regime is good. And then you, you, you talk to them and say, gosh, you're trained in UC Berkeley. What happened to train? They say, yeah, we understand that. But then after you travel doing the field research in China, low level can do it, but nationwide, how can you do it? And you need to have all kinds of preconditions you probably need, you really need to be. So, you know, don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know the solution. But I, I can sleep very well since I don't need to worry about it. That's the other person's problem. But certainly, certainly that, that's really a concern. So you have two sides of China. It depends on which side you want to look into. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Professor, thank you for coming to SOAS. And as your survey has shown, and as you've mentioned before, identity politics plays a huge role in Taiwanese politics, or the contradiction between whether you're Taiwan or ROC or uh -huh. something else. So does this also play a role in Taiwan's foreign policy with regards to the Diaoyi Tai dispute? and how the uh -huh. ROC has a really contradictory approach to, as to whether or not it actually wants to enforce its sovereignty claims towards the island. Thank you. Uh, that issue is, the Aorita issue is uh, another interesting issue. Identity politics doesn't play with it, but then the, the same thing is, you have a power politics in the sense, Taiwan is small potato, squeezed by two giants. That's China, or even Japan, or even Japan, behind Japan, there is the uh, United States, okay? So what Taiwan can do? Everyone say, well, Taiwan do a lot. You know, you need to reclaim. Yeah, my angel will stand on one the remote island and say, well, Diao Yita is actually, my angel probably got his own personal conviction very strongly because he was Bao Diao Yun Dong. That means the Bao Diao movement. You know, and then if you are in my generation, a little actually, I'm not so old, but then, <laughs> the, my previous generation, they participated in Bao Diao in the United States. You understand what I'm talking about there. Because at that time, uh, uh, Taiwanese students in the United States, they all really gung ho, they blame, but eventually the movement split. So, split, the reason is because they blame on Taiwan, one group would blame on Taiwan and say, You haven't done enough. Where's the nationalism? Where you're dealing with Japan, blah, blah, all kind of things. On the other hand, you have some group and say they, they, they believe that China can do it because China issued a stronger statement even though no action taken, but then they, they say, and the China actually also mentioned that, well, we're going to resolve this issue in a, in a peaceful way because China really needs Japan's financial law. So, but still, look at the statement that they believe in China. If China really presented cultural revolution from outside is a different picture, like outsider, insider point of view. Okay. So they split. So my angel really believe in it. From Taiwan's point of view, sometimes there is a different opinion. <coughs> Li Dongwei would say Diao Yita belongs to Japan. But uh, that's his view. But anyway, my injury list for some of the majority of it. And survey data will show you that actually strong, I mean high percentage of the, it doesn't matter which, which side you are in, pen green or, 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 or pen blue, majority of it support Taiwan's territorial plan. Okay, so you have uh, that kind of uh, public opinion supporting it. My angel believe in it. But then the question is, how are you going to do it? Do you want to take any kind of action? Uh, taking action to invade, easy. It's the holding is a problem. Is that right? And oh, how, how are you going to take it? Probably very easy. You just, again, sneaking one person and put a flag and say, oh, this is mine, and then go home. 
Yeah, it's pretty much like an article in 1970s. Some of the country, Argentina, I forgot, Chile, they, they, are, they are deliver baby over there. And it, the reason is they, in Antarctica, they want to have a birth certificate, prove it. And all they set up a, a post office over there. They ask the person and say, send the postcard. The reason I want to put a stamp, so prove this is my territory. But then, well, what's the point? I mean, in terms of long run. So military action is not likely to happen. And then you also squeeze that. Uh, Japan, supported by the security treaty, provision, and then the definition of that particular security treaty actually indicate that. The US will defend Japan if Japan's any kind of a territorial control under Japanese administration, we're not talking about sovereignty, under Japanese administration, the United States will defend it. So US has no other option as to defend it. Even though in 1961, the Senate debate actually talking about, some of the senators actually already talked about it. Are you sure that's a, a like a, a blank check, a blank check given to given to Japan? If Japan, it's just like alliance politics. You you you're afraid of it to be trapped, but at the same time you are also afraid that you're going to be abandoned, uh, abandonment and uh, entrapment, that kind of a play into it. So U.S. senator actually worry about it. By that time, you know, I say come and say, don't worry about it. That, that will not happen. Actually, we can control Japan. And so Japan this time really take advantage of that. Okay. So if you decide to do it, you also irritate Japan. And Japan, remember, it's not the Japan you worry about. It's the big guy standing behind it. You have to worry about it. Okay? China also worry about, yes, I can do it. But on the other hand, if I run into it, do I want to engage any kind of military conflict with the United States? Again, it's, it's a big guy. You have to worry about it. So China also that. But China also need to show it. And then the, the, the thing is, China is quite you know, Delicate in this way. Like one time, someone asked me and said, "What are you going to do?" I said, "Oh, it's very easy. What China need to do it? Send in a very slow-moving, non-armed, for example, aircraft. Slowly, you know, a single glider will be fine. Just oh, cruise around, touch upon the territorial point 12 miles. I declare my. I, I, I'm not saying that I declare certainly, but I don't recognize your territorial right. And at least I want to create it." The image or impression that it's a controversial area. Okay? You're not having a sole control of the, that particular island. I just need to do it. So, you know, that kind of thing. Or sometimes you send in the fishing boats into it. It's, if you serve in the offshore islands in Jimen, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's sometimes China got a thousand boats coming in. What are they going to do? Shoot them? Everyone? How? But then they keep on coming. So you file on this one, and then there's some kind of mutual understanding you want to do it. So China, if China decides, just one time they send thousands of ships getting into that area. Well, well, you know, that, that's a possibility. But the point that China tried to do is, well, maybe I just need to make sure that you accept that there's a dispute. Okay, so that's all. What Taiwan can do, my director quite courageous, quote unquote. I don't know why, but then he, 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 he did it. He did send in the Coast Guard ships to escort it. And then when China's Coast Guard sort of was saying that, well, you know, we are brothers and we want to help you, Taiwan's Coast Guard said, don't do it. It's my business. Please stay away. <laughs> why do they need to say that? Because they don't want to have that kind of joint yeah. uh, operation over there. And that's, that's really difficult. Because if you've got joint operation, don't forget that you need the United States to be the backup. And then you don't want to irritate Japan because you know, there, there's a domestic consideration. Some people, they really like Japan, not simply just sushi, but also you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> they really like, like Japan. You, 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 all, you grow up in, in Japan, and Taiwan, you understand that kind of post-colonialism, you have that kind of legacy, you have, and also you have a comparison, and it becomes a difficult issue to handle. Okay? And so, so that, that really becomes a complicated domestic consideration, external consideration. So what you can do is you can issue all kinds of statements. It's a very cheapy one, even though no one cares or no one listens to you. But then you still need to con continue to show up that you are a reasonable guy, even though that really doesn't work very well because not even the media coverage for international press. And it's unfortunate. But whatever you talk about, actually, that's based on his study in terms of the Diao Yi Tai. He did publish his uh, a law school dissertations, and you know, that, that's in 84, I believe. And then he, he pretty much followed follow that script into it. But that, that kind of statement, pretty much the, 
he understands international law. So that part is in terms of a demarcation line, in terms of it's a, how we're going to medium line, or you need to take into a historical consideration of fishery right. And ICJ is usually, again, political, as, as we all understand it. So, and so he followed that line. So Taiwan actually, for this issue, luckily you have a domestic support, so it can come out. And then that issue also sort of, to some degree, cut across the identity division. Either blue or green, they, they really get into it. But that also means, uh, does that mean some people, they say, well, Taiwan unified, that means China is out. So what kind of nationalism is that? So it, it, it's, it's interesting. OK, I think we've got time for one final question. Anyone want to? Sorry, my answer is too long. But you have to understand, professor is just like my kids sometimes say, ask you one simple question, you give all kinds of options. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, professors have it. Professor has it. Okay, in that case then, uh, let's um, finish here then. And let's thank uh, Professor Lee. Thank you very much. <laughs>